In this lesson, we'll further our discussion of proofs with universal sense to if and only if statements. Here's the type of statement we're interested in this time. For all x in the universe, p of x if and only if q of x. This is what we call the biconditional statement. Basically, the idea is that p of x and q of x have the same logical values. How do we prove a statement of this form? Remember what p if and only if q means. It means that p implies q and q implies p. So if we prove both of these parts, then we have proven the implication in both directions, which proves the if and only if. Here's our first example. For all sets A, B, and C, C is a subset of A intersect B, if and only if C is a subset of A, and C is a subset of B. Let's start off by claiming our sets. Let A, B, and C be sets. Again, we're picking these sets arbitrarily. Now we need to show P implies Q and Q implies P. What we're going to do first is we're going to show that this side implies this side. Usually the way that we notate that is with this little arrow. The arrow references which direction we're actually going. Assume C is a subset of A intersect B. Now remember we want to show C is a subset of A and C is a subset of B. Remember from the last lesson, to show something's a subset, you pick an arbitrary element in the smaller set and show it's an element of the larger set. We need to pick an arbitrary element of C. And let X be an element of C. Now let's write down what we have. We've assumed that C is a subset of A intersect B, right? Then X is an element of A intersect B because C was a subset of A intersect B. We had that as part of our assumption. What does this mean? So X is an element of A and X is an element of B. Remember for an intersection, that means that the element is in both sets. It's the AND operation. If you look, however, we're actually already finished. We assumed that X was an element of C and we wanted to show that X was an element of A, which we did. We also wanted to show that X was an element of B, which we did. One line, not bad. Now we're going to do the other direction, which we usually denote with a left pointing arrow. This time we're going to assume this side of the implication and prove that this side implies the left side. Just a word of caution when you're doing this. When you have a proof of an if and only if, and you do the left to right implication, you may pick up information that you might be tempted to use when you're continuing in your proof. But generally speaking, the information derived from the assumption on the left cannot be used later when you're trying to prove what is on the left by assuming the right. Be careful. Basically, when you move on to the other side of the proof, try to start on as clean of a slate as possible. Here's what we'll do. Assume C is a subset of A and C is a subset of B. We want to prove that C is a subset of A intersect B. So let's let X be an element of C. And let X be an element of C. Now we want to show that X is an element of the larger set. A intersect B. Well, let's use what we have. We know that C is a subset of A and C is a subset of B. X is an element of C, so it's an element of A and an element of B. Then X is an element of A and X is an element of B. So what does that mean? Well, that means it's in the intersection. So X is an element of A intersect B. And now that we've proven both directions of the proof, we are finished with this one. Again, the goal is prove the implication both ways. Here's the next example. 
for all x and the real numbers, x to the fourth minus one equals zero, if and only if x squared minus one equals zero. Now I will say that of the assumptions that we've talked about, we never mentioned anything about roots. Roots and exponents behave a little bit strangely when we're trying to work with things, so it's nice to try to keep it simple, down to some of the basic properties of real numbers. For this particular proof, I'm going to use the zero product property, and I'll show you how in just a moment. Let's start off with this. Let x be an element of the reals. Again, we're picking it arbitrarily. But I want to use a few properties. I know when I'm going through this problem, I'm going to need a little bit of information. Just for a little bit of scratch, let's take x to the fourth minus one and see if we can factor it. We get x squared plus one times x squared minus one. What we're going to end up doing with this is we're going to need the fact that x squared plus one does not equal zero. Let's quickly go back through and use this idea and get a claim that x squared plus one is greater than zero. We've actually proven this once before, but it's definitely needed to be copied in this proof. And note that x squared is greater than or equal to zero. Therefore, x squared plus one is greater than zero. The detail that we used last time was we added one to both sides of this inequality and then noticed that one was greater than zero. However, we won't write quite that much detail. This is one of the nice things about proofs though. Sometimes you introduce information that seems like, where did that come from? Why did they do that? But then you get later in the proof and suddenly you're thinking, oh wait, that was useful to have. That's what we like to sometimes call hindsight while reading a proof. Now let's go into the if and only if. We'll start out with the left to right direction. Remember, we're going to assume the left side and prove the right side. Assume x to the fourth minus one is equal to zero. And again, my goal is to show that x squared minus one is equal to zero. Now let's go ahead and factor it. Then x squared plus one times x squared minus one equals zero. Again, this is one of those places where your reader should be decent at algebra, that they can go ahead and follow this step without you having to explain that you just factored. Now we're going to use the zero product property. Thus, x squared plus one equals zero, or x squared minus one equals zero. One of these has to be true, or possibly both. But look at what I did just a minute ago. I showed that x squared plus one was greater than zero, right? So x squared plus one cannot equal zero. And by the way, the reason this really holds is because x is a real number. If x was not a real number, this might be a little bit different. Whatever the case, let's use this fact. Since x squared plus one is greater than zero, the only possibility that remains is x squared minus one equals zero. That's what we were trying to show. Now let's do the other direction. For this direction, we'll be assuming that x squared minus one equals zero and showing that x to the fourth minus one is equal to zero. Assume x squared minus one is equal to zero. Now what are we gonna do with this? Somehow we need to recover x to the fourth minus one. And again, while we can't use any work that we did on the previous step or any logic that we got, we can look back and say, hey, this was a kinda useful thing to use right here. If I use this fact was equal to x to the fourth minus one, that could be helpful here. Let's multiply both sides of this equation by x squared plus one. I'm allowed to do that because x squared plus one is greater than zero. You can't multiply both sides of an equation by zero, but that never happens in this case. Multiplying both sides by x squared plus one, we get x squared plus one times x squared minus one is equal to zero. And yes, I did multiply the right side by x squared plus one, but zero times anything is still zero. Thus, x to the fourth minus one is equal to zero. And remember, that's what we were trying to show. So we're finished. Let's summarize this new style of proof. 
How do you prove a statement of the form for all x in the universe, p of x, if and only if, q of x? What do you think? For an arbitrary x in the universe, we want to prove that p of x implies q of x and that q of x implies p of x.